Our Father, you in fact are holy, righteous, and above us. And Father, we're not. We're sinful, wicked, corrupt. Father, we confess nothing in us good dwells except for the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, you'd be with us this morning as we open these texts. As we return to the Gospel of Mark this morning, we ask that you'd be with us as we continue this journey in the life of Christ, now walking off the, the Mount of Transfiguration, having exercised a young boy with demonic possession. We're now confronted with the question is, who is the greatest? Well, as you read these Gospel accounts, remind us that the answer is Christ. He is the greatest. And though he was the greatest, he submitted himself and became man, humbled himself below the angels, and for a period of time during the incarnation and earthly ministry, was frail, and he suffered, and he was nailed to the cross beams. In ultimate submission and humiliation, he bore the sins of the world, took upon himself our shame and punishment, and Father, he was crucified and died, was buried. Father, we don't gather this morning because our, our Savior is dead. We gather because three days later he rose from the tomb victorious, having conquered death, hell, and the grave. As we read these gospel stories and the question is asked, who is the greatest? Remind us again and again that this is not about us. It's about the Christ who loves us and gave himself for us. For it's to him we pray, and everyone says, Bible hand, please turn to the Gospel of John Mark, chapter 9 this morning, beginning in verse 30 through verse 37. So Mark 9, 30 through 37, continuing on in this series. The subtitle, of course, is, Who is the Greatest of All Time? Let me ask some questions to kind of prime our minds about thinking about who the greatest is. Who's the greatest basketball player of all time? Is it Michael Jordan or LeBron James? It depends who you ask, isn't it? Or maybe you're older and you think, well, that's an argument for another day. That was Bill Russell or Wilt Chamberlain. That was the argument back, back in the day. Which of those two were the greatest? Who's the greatest scientist of all time? Is it Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein? Marie Curie or Stephen Hawking? Depends who you ask. Who's the greatest country singer of all time? Is it John Denver or Hank Williams? George Jones or Loretta Lynn? Or none of the above. Maybe it's someone else I didn't mention. Who's the greatest American president? George Washington or FDR? Abraham Lincoln or JFK? Who's the greatest artist of all time? Michelangelo or Picasso? Salvador Dali or Georgia O'Keeffe? Depends who you ask, isn't it? How, I'll put this on the screen. The question is this. How do you define the greatest how do you find the greatest NBA players? The most points scored in a game or most points scored in a career? How do you find, define the greatest singer? The most records sold in history or the most popular song in history? How do you measure the importance of a scientific discovery? Is it in most lives saved or most lives killed? Is it measured by a single performance? or a lifetime achievement? Let me ask this question as I put this on the screen. Is greatness measured by inventions that enable one to breathe or musical scores that take one's breath away? What makes one great? That's the question this morning. Jesus defines in the gospel what makes one great. In fact, the greatest in the kingdom of God is not what you might think. In my discovery to know the greatest person in the kingdom of, of God's creation and the kingdom of God's history is not measured by the number of seats in a sanctuary that are filled or most books that are written by a Christian author or most hours aired on a TV network somewhere. The greatest Christians in the history of Christianity may not ever have made their appearance on TV at all or name in some novel or journal or book anywhere. They may have lived in some obscure remote village and lived and died serving their entire lives to Christ and leaving this life have been the greatest Christian of all time. The last time in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, this is 
bids us a bit of a reminder here. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was with Elijah and Moses on the mountain, and Peter, James, and John witnessed that. And then after that mountaintop experience, pun intended, they walk down and have a valley experience. They see a demonically possessed boy, and Christ exercises that demon. So if we go back to Peter's great confession in, back in chapter 8, Peter confessed that Jesus was the Lord, and then you get to the mountaintop, the Lord professed that Jesus, of course, is Christ, his son, the Lord. And then you see the last time Christ exercises demons and it demonstrates his, his power and his authority, his lordship over creation. The story picks up today right where that left off last week. So if we could have, we could have just kept preaching the same text in the same context. Of they just exercised the demon. They're walking now, as you can see, we'll see in a moment, a map on the screen from the north down to Capernaum. So here's the text, Mark 9, 30. They went on from there, Mount Hermon, and passed through Galilee. That's the region in the north around the Sea of Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, and here's what he was teaching, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Verse 32. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. There's an important word in the important phrase or word in this passage here that I want us to draw our attention to because we often gloss over certain words because in the English they just they don't impact us as strong if you saw in the original languages here. That word in the original text I want to show you is delivered. I'll put this on the screen. He said, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Now the Greek word for delivered there is paradidomai, to be handed over, to be given over. It's the act of transferring one thing to the possession of another thing. Jesus said, I'm going to be handed over to wicked, sinful men. What does that mean? Well, we're going to see as we get into the Gospels and the Passion Week that Jesus, in fact, was delivered by Judas to the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, after trying Jesus at their, their religious trial, will hand him over again to the Romans. And, of course, Pilate will then, after he demand, uh, gives a verdict guilty, will then uh, hand him over to those who will crucify him. We see at Christ's trial multiple handings over of Jesus. He was handed to the Sanhedrin by Judas. He was handed from the Sanhedrin to the Romans uh, by, you know, by the Sanhedrin. He was handed from the Roman authorities to those who crucify him. Let me ask the question. I'll put this on the screen. This begs the question. Who handed Jesus over to sinful men? Well, the answer may shock you. It was God the Father who handed him over to sinful men for the crucifixion. Now, we know the Bible says, Jesus said, that he laid his life down. No one can take his life, but he laid his life down for sinful men. He submitted himself to the will of God. This is how this looked, if you think of this, about this logically in the past. In eternity past, before creation, there was just the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in eternity past. And the second person of the Trinity said to the Father, I will go and redeem those sinful men whom you will create, and they'll fall into sin, and I will send myself in time to redeem them. I will submit to your authority. And then when Christ came, born in Bethlehem, born, uh, born in, uh, among a sinful, wicked generation, born to, to a virgin named Mary, he lived a sinless life, and he, he committed himself to the will of God at that point. How many times did Christ predict his own crucifixion in the, in the Gospels? It might surprise you, but I'll show you right now very quickly here, seven times, and I'll put these on the screen here, seven times Jesus predicts his own death in the Gospels. The first time he predicts his death is back in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. Uh, he, he predicts he's going to be killed and he's going to raise to life. Look in John chapter, chapter 2 after he cleansed the temple. John chapter 2, verse 18. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show for us doing these things? Verse 19 of John chapter 2. Jesus says this, Destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, he just cleansed the temple. He just ran the money changers out. But he said, destroy the temple. I'll raise it in three days. Look at, look at their response, verse, verse 20. The Jews said then, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. And you'll raise it in three days? That's quite a feat. If it took all these men uh, with taxpayer dollars and unlimited resources of, uh, of ancient Israel to build this temple, to remodel and build Herod's temple. And in 46 years, Jesus says, well, I'll, I can rebuild it in three days. You know, a lot of times when folks contract for the government to do certain work, whether it's highway work or whatever, it takes longer than the time a lot than time estimated, doesn't it? 
And when someone has work on their house, like we had work on the church, church basement, it took us longer than we thought in some parts to get it done, right? Uh, it always takes longer than you expect. Uh, if it took 46 years, Jesus says, well, I can do it in three days. That's a, a significant uh, decrease in time, isn't it, from 46 years to three days? Uh, if he bid for that job and, and promised in three days, he better deliver, right? Look at verse 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So Jesus is talking about the temple of his body. You take this temple and tear it down, I'll rise it, raise it in three days. He's talking about his body here in the resurrection. Now, the context of John chapter 2 is he's just cleansed the temple of the money changers. And, and while they're still in the temple area, as the, as the dust sort of settles and those who are run out of the temple area and the animals are scattering, he says, they say, what sign are you the Messiah to do this? He says, well, you tear the temple down, I built it in three days. And he's pointing to, when you kill me, and I know you want to, three days I'll come back to life. That's the first time he predicted his death and resurrection. The next time was when the Pharisees came a second time asking for a son. Look at Matthew 12, Matthew 12, 39. But Jesus answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and no sign will be given to it except, here's the one sign Christ promises to unbelievers, except the sign of the prophet Jonah, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When unbelievers ask for a sign, what do we do? As, as those who present the gospel, we start with the resurrection of Christ. When unbelievers say, why are you a Christian? We first should start not with the creation story or the flood story or the, uh, the exodus from Egypt. We start with the, with the resurrection. All Christians are bearers of the good news. What's the good news? That Christ rose from the dead. Jesus said, you unbelievers, you want a sign? After I'm dead, I'll walk out of that grave three days later. The next time Christ uh, gave, uh, gave this prediction was in Matthew 16. His disciples said this, Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Three times in Scripture so far, he's predicted clearly, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to raise from the dead. Now, if someone told you you're going to be, buried, be killed in Memphis, Tennessee, and buried in Memphis, Tennessee, and raised to life in Memphis, Tennessee, what are you going to do? You're going to avoid Memphis, Tennessee. I'm going to drive around. i got Arkansas. I'll drive around Memphis, Tennessee. If i got to go uh, to Mississippi, I'll drive around Memphis, Tennessee. Right? I'm going to avoid this. But he says this knowing full well he's going to go to Jerusalem, where he's going to be handed over to sinful men, crucified, buried, and raised to life. Look at the next time, Matthew 17, verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, we saw this last week, Jesus commanded the to tell them, until no one the vision, until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And then Matthew 17, 22. And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of sinful men, and they will kill him and be raised to life on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. And then lastly, the seventh time is Matthew 20, 18 and following. I uh, said this, See, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they'll be condemned him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified to be raised to life on the third day. Now, that was six times. There's one more time. The last time Christ predicts his death is the night before he's, the night he's arrested, the night before the crucifixion. He's in Gethsemane the disciples, gathered around, in the Garden of Gethsemane, listen to what he says here, Matthew 26. This is the last time he predicts his death and crucifixion, his resurrection. And when they sung a hymn, this is after the Lord's Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives, verse 31, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, he quotes the Old Testament, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. So the seventh time Christ predicts his, his crucifixion, his burial, resurrection, is in, is in Gethsemane, hours before Judas comes back in the garden with his temple guard to arrest him. And he says this time about the disciples. The first time he mentions this, the disciples' reaction is this. When it happens, you're going to scatter like cockroaches. You're going to flee like sheep whose shepherd has been killed in the field. You're going to scatter and run away. When this happens, this is how you're going to react. But he said, when I'm raised up, Meet me in Galilee. Jesus says to the disciples on this occasion, I'm going to Jerusalem. 
to be handed over. It's a legal word, to be, to be given the custody of somebody else to be crucified. The Father gave Christ over to the crucifixion. Look in verse 33, Mark chapter 9, verse 33. Let's get back to the story. Mark 9, 33. And they came to Capernaum. This is Jesus' adopted hometown. And when he was in the house, he asked them. I love the question. He always asks these questions to kind of elicit a response to get information going here. Here's the question. What were you discussing on the way? That's a long walk from Mount Hermon to Capernaum. And they're in groups talking, and Jesus with this group talking, and the other groups back here talking, and he overhears part of what they're saying. So he asked them inside the house of Capernaum where he's now resting, what were you guys talking about along the road from, from Hermon to Capernaum? Verse 34, but they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Verse 35, and he sat down and he called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must la be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. The Greek word there for the, that child means toddler. So the image of the artistic rendering is pretty accurate. It's a little boy who could, be, who could stand by himself and also be placed in the lap of an adult. It's a toddler, uh, two, three years old. It's like Waylon, right? If you could catch him, he would, this would be Waylon. He'd be on Jesus' lap. He'd be a child that age, that small, that young, who can walk, but also need, can be sat on someone's lap pretty easily. He picks up a child and sits him on his lap. And he says, what were you guys arguing about earlier? Are you arguing along the road there? What were you arguing about? Now, they're, they're too embarrassed to talk about what they're arguing about, aren't they? If they're talking about who was the greatest emperor in the first century, that was something they could debate about openly. If they're talking about who was the greatest rabbi of all time, they could argue about that openly. But they're talking about themselves. I'm better than you, John. Oh, I'm better than you, Philip. I'm better than you, Peter. Right? They're arguing among themselves as to which of them is the greatest. The nine must be saying he took Peter, James, and John to the mountaintop for this event on the, the transfiguration experience. They, he, they left us out. It must be those three must be among the top three favorites of Jesus. And then someone said, well, he took those three because they're slow learners. They need extra time with the teacher. The rest of us didn't need that. So the rest of us nine probably are greater than those three. And they're arguing about who's the greatest among themselves. Jesus says, what are you guys arguing about? They don't say anything. For the first time ever, Peter's speechless. He can't say what he's arguing about because it'd be too embarrassing to say it. Now, I want you guys to notice this. Uh, they're in a house in Capernaum. It was in this very same house we see in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus heals this paralyzed man who's lowered in the house when the roof was torn off on this mat by his friends. It's in this same house where Jesus will heal Peter's mother-in-law and then just after this turns her house into an outpatient medical clinic and the sick come to her front door to be healed of Jesus all day long. It's in this house, a Peter's house, where he does so many miracles. It's in this house he settles the debate once and for all. Who's the greatest? It's in this house he finds a child. And many scholars think this is Peter's son, Peter's little boy, who happens to run around the house and Peter... Jesus catches him by the shirt tail as he's, you know, a little toddler's there, and he grabs him and says, you want to be great? He puts a child in his lap. He says, you got to receive this. you got to receive me like you would receive this child. The marginalized, the outcast, the powerless of society, those who are overlooked, if you want to be great, welcome those into your life. So many of us make friends with those who can further our career, can do something for us, who can get up, give us a favor. I'm friends with a car salesman. If I need a car, he can help me out. I'm friends with a guy who does HVAC work. If I need HVAC work, he can hook me up. I'm friends with a guy who owns a pickup truck. If I got to move furniture, I can call this guy. Think about that. Think of the friendships you have with people in this life who are there just to meet your needs. And Jesus says, that's not the way it ought to be. Make friends with those who cannot further your career. Make friends with those who don't want a pickup truck. Make friends with those who don't want a bush hog or can't lend you a tiller. Make friends with those who can give you nothing in the friendship. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you've got to be lower than these even little children who can give you nothing in life. You can't come and put a roof on your house. He's a toddler. 
you know, he can't he can't uh, load your garbage and take it off for you. He's a toddler. He can give you nothing in life. He's only going to take from you. Take and take and take. If you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, accept folks who can't give but can only take from you. That's what Jesus says here. And I'll put this on the screen. If you want to be first in the kingdom of God, you must be last. If you want to reign with Christ up there, you must serve others down here. It's that simple, isn't it? Jesus ends their argument once and for all by showing them how to receive the lowest in society. That's how God receives them. You see a homeless guy on the street or someone who's in, in, a, in a tough way, and you look down at that person maybe for a little bit, right? And that's how God sees you in your estate. You've got nothing to offer God, but he loves you anyway. Listen carefully. You will never know God if you don't come to him like a child. Until you cry out like a child does for his or her mother or father in desperation, you will never know God until you cry out that way. Let us pray. Father, come before you this morning.